Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the January 27th edition of the weekly COVID-19 situational update. Very happy to have you all with us today. Thank you especially to our elected officials who've been able to join us today and, uh, and the media who uh, have been such a great partner through all of this. Um, we will get underway and um, start off with a, a moment to pause and acknowledge the land. We respectfully acknowledge that Peterborough Public Health is located on the Treaty 20 Michisagic territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagic and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausoleil, and Georgina Island First Nations. Peterborough Public Health respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We are all treaty people. Okay, I'll now invite our board chair, Mayor Andy Mitchell, to start us off with some opening remarks. Please go ahead, Andy. Thank you, Brittany. I want to begin today by extending my condolences to the families and friends of those impacted by the recent deaths from COVID-19 in our community. So far in January, we have lost 16 souls. Local deaths are now beginning to mirror the experience across Ontario. These deaths and thousands across Ontario and Canada and everywhere are so tragic, so very sad, and so very heartbreaking. The efforts of Peterborough Public Health to limit future deaths, hospitalizations, and cases continue. Good progress continues on the vaccine front. So far, 321,507 doses have been administered to over 121,000 people in the Peterborough region. Most adults in our community have begun an immunization program. 89% have one dose, 87% have two, and 58% have three. We now have had 50% of our younger children, five to 11 vaccinated with the first dose. And among older children, 12 to 17, 82% have had a first dose. You wouldn't know it from what you see sometimes on social media, but Ontarians have embraced vaccines for what they are. The best way to protect themselves their families and their communities. Almost 92% of Ontarians aged 12 and over have received at least one dose of vaccine. More people have been vaccinated in Canada, over 32 million than almost anywhere else on a per capita basis in the world. The measures that were implemented in late December designed to reduce contacts have begun to have an effect. Case counts seem to be declining and this will hopefully lead to a reduced strain on our healthcare system. In response, starting Monday, the province will begin to cautiously lift public health restrictions. This is welcome news for residents and for our many small businesses that have been impacted. As we move forward, it will be important to continue to be prudent and practice appropriate public health measures. Adhere to indoor and outdoor social gathering limits. Adhere to capacity limits when at stores, facilities, or other indoor venues. Wear a properly fitting mask when indoors or outdoors when you cannot maintain a physical distance of two meters. If you are ill, stay home and do not go to work or school. And please follow all isolation protocols. This has been a difficult few weeks. But increasing vaccinations and public health measures are making a positive difference. To all of you stepping up, thank you. Stay well, be safe, and in all things, be kind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Mitchell. Okay, let's have a look at the data. So I'll turn it over to our Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Piggott, to lead us through these next few slides. Go ahead, Dr. Piggott. Thanks so much, Brittany. and. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope uh, that you're well today. 
Um, I'll begin with a uh, data update uh, for you all on the situation, uh, and I'll begin with vaccinations, our, our continued good news and uh, the continued work uh, our team and our partners in the community uh, are doing to make vaccines accessible and get them out there is working. Um, we're almost 2% higher in third dose coverage than we were last week uh, in those 18 plus year olds, um, and I'm, uh, you know, continuing to um, pay close attention to the under five year olds. Uh, we're seeing good progress um, with uh, with that group. Um, and now uh, with at least um, uh, 86 percent of those um, uh, five years and older having received a first dose, um, but there's still lots of progress to, to go. So you can see here um, on this slide uh, with one dose coverage at 51%. Uh, we know that that means that nearly half of people still haven't started out on a vaccine course in the five to 11 year old age group and lots of room for um, improvements. Uh, so looking forward to that and we're trying to make it uh, more accessible and we know that getting vaccinated continues to be really important for children um, in order to keep schools uh, open and as safe as possible through this pandemic. Uh, on this next slide, you can see uh, that um, uh, this is um, a picture showing how protective the vaccine is for the intensive care unit, hospitalization prevention, as well as prevention of infections. This is a figure from the Ontario Science Table. And of note, in recent uh, weeks, we're now seeing the improvement uh, in prevention against infection. And the improvement now is creeping up to back towards 60% effectiveness um, in individuals with at least two doses. And I believe what we're seeing here is the protection that three doses is now giving us. So we always knew that um, two doses was good, but three was better at preventing severe disease, including death, ICU admission, and hospitalization. But I'm very encouraged to see the performance of the vaccine appears to be increasing as more people get their third dose. And the protection uh, of the vaccine has gone up and to a level where it, it really is playing an important role in stopping infection, not just people getting very severely sick. On the next slide, um, I want to mention the walk-in clinics uh, that we are now operating um, because we want to make uh, vaccines as accessible as possible. Uh, so this week we've opened up more walk-in uh, appointments and um, individuals in, in all of these groups uh, can now walk into our clinics. And, uh, there are uh, designate, designated age groups, so be sure to walk into the appropriate clinic and at our website, slash vaccine clinics, you can find more information on those, but uh, we really want you to come out and get the vaccine and make it as easy as possible. I'm also excited to share that yesterday we celebrated one year of administering the COVID-19 vaccine in the Peterborough region. Um, so a huge shout out to the community for stepping up and receiving more than 321,000 doses of vaccine in this year, and that really is a remarkable feat. On to our next slide, we can see um, the number of active cases, uh, which is uh, much lower than it had been. But a reminder, it is essentially meaningless and the tip of the iceberg of what is actually out there circulating because of the changes in PCR testing uh, availability and criteria. Um, so we should continue to take significant caution in this number. Um, and we are now relying on other pieces, including our wastewater surveillance, the hospitalizations and deaths, um, and we continue to see a significant burden in those areas. Uh, we will shortly have uh, Dr. Kyle um, from Trent University speak about the wastewater surveillance program, um, but I continue to be very concerned about transmission in the community, a high burden on our hospitals, and the increased death rate, which is very concerning. Uh, the increased death rate, which I spoke to last week, um, has meant that uh, and, and today we will report an additional death, uh, which will bring our total up to 47. This has meant that nearly half of the deaths that we've had in the pandemic, through the whole pandemic, have been in the past month and a half of the Omicron um, wave. Uh, when I began at Peterborough Public Health, uh, there were nearly half the number of deaths at 25, and we have seen this number increase because unlike previous waves, one, two, and three, where Peterborough managed to have a far, far lower rate of infection, we have matched the Ontario average in a bad way, this wave in Omicron, and we have seen 
the proportionate deaths increase accordingly. And we have also borne a disproportionately bad impact on our community through deaths in the Omicron wave because of the underlying vulnerability of our region with an older population and individuals who have more risk factors for severe disease. So we've reported um, now six additional deaths since last update. Um, and this does continue, and I am very concerned that the death trend will continue because it lags behind transmission over the next few weeks. On to the next slide, we are also sharing that there's currently 21 inpatients with confirmed COVID in addition to others um, who may have COVID. Uh, they are managing one outbreak um, and have received a patient in transfer. And I want to share the message with our uh, from our hospital partners um, who couldn't be here for today's call that they continue to be deeply concerned about the situation in the community, the impact of COVID-19 on hospitalizations and deaths, and the impact on their own staffing and the pressures that that has created with staff isolating because of infection or as close contacts. On to our next uh, slide. Um, this slide again shows the age distribution of cases, and I continue to um, really implore people who haven't got their third dose, especially younger folks, to go out and get it. Um, if you are 18 plus and eligible, we really need you to come forward and we need you to recognize this is a three dose vaccine because the cases that we continue to see are disproportionately in younger individuals and people who are not vaccinated or not fully vaccinated. On to our next slide, you can see that the number of active outbreaks um, has declined slightly from 19 to 16. That's cautiously optimistic news and a big thank you to all of our partners in the congregate care settings, retirement residences and long term care who have been taking these matters incredibly seriously and making sure that um, residents are protected. We have also been working with them to ensure that at the same time as we prevent transmission of COVID in these settings, um, you know, residents are not unnecessarily isolated for prolonged periods of time and that we are reasonable and measured um, and that we uh, make sure that residents can continue to have, you know, good quality of life and the attention that they need as they um, uh, progress through this Omicron wave and these um, pandemics, this pandemic. Um, on to our next slide, um, I uh, am going to introduce a Professor Christopher Kyle from Trent University, and uh, he has been leading our surveillance efforts around wastewater over the past um, uh, period of time in the pandemic, um, has been doing a tremendous job. It's been a wonderful collaboration and a real pleasure personally to get to know him and, and the work that him and his team has been doing. And I wanted him to share directly um, some of the evidence uh, and a bit of information on this because I think it's really relevant um, now that case counts, especially now that case counts are not as meaningful. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Professor Kyle. Thank you. Thank you very much for the for the introduction. I'll just get my my presentation queued up here. Perfect. So I'll just assume that everybody can see the, the screen and, and uh, introduce myself. My name is uh, Christopher Kyle. I work at Trent University. I'm a professor in the forensic science department, but I also run the DNA Center at Trent, and we've been lucky enough to be part of the Ontario COVID-19 wastewater surveillance program that's sponsored by the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. And specifically, our work covers Peterborough, Belleville, Millbrook, Lakefield, uh, Norwood and Havelock wastewater treatment plants now, but we also do some work at residences at Trent, Fleming and several retirement homes in our in our community. And so what today's talk is going to be about is really, you know, there's increasing interest in, in the wastewater work right now. So we want to tell you how it works, um, what the data do and do not say, because th there's some important provisos and, and uh, that we need to make as we project these these data and use them for public health measures. Um, or to inform public health. And then I'm going to wrap up with uh, some of the, ac the actual data that we've been getting in our community. So I think these first pictures uh, demonstrate some of the, the work that's happening. This work's happening in a slightly colder environment for my field crew, who is amazing, and I want to thank them just as we get started, but also my lab crew that's worked extremely hard to get uh, next day data to public health, working some really long hours. And I'd like to acknowledge all the wastewater treatment facilities that are, are working to give us these samples 
And then finally, Public Health has been a wonderful partner, Dr. Salvatera um, and now Dr. Piggott have been just great advocates for this work and I appreciate that support and, and, and your teams that assist me. So we, for a facility, we'll take, um, we'll try and map out using uh, information from both the facility and the city and, and map out a sewer that actually links to a particular building. We'll then put a line down into the sewer. We've got these machines that are taking about 100 mils every 15 minutes over 24 hours for a composite sample um, because every little flush is important to us as we're trying to detect COVID. We'll then take a small subsample of about one liter and then that goes to the lab. So what do we do with these data? So how we detect the virus uh, that, that leads to COVID? Well, I think there's important components here. We need to acknowledge that we've got both asymptomatic and symptomatic shedders. So some people are feeling perfectly fine, especially in the younger demographics. Um, and then some people are, are highly symptomatic, but both are shedding virus from their feces. And that when you're on a sewer system is going to the wastewater treatment plant. And they're taking these composite samples, similar to what we're taking at the field sites and collecting about 10 liters overall from one day. And from that, we take a really small subsample, only 80 mils, and we spin that down to get a fecal pellet. And I'm always amazed at just, you know, of the hundreds of thousands of liters that are going through a wastewater treatment plant, it all really comes down to 80 milliliters that we spin down. And we've got Audrey here that's taking a subsample and spinning, spinning it down the lab. We then extract the RNA from that fecal pellet. And in that is the virus that we're looking to detect for COVID. We've got Brad here adding some chemicals prior to extraction on this robot by Colleen at Dr. Doyle. And then we, we actually use this um, machine to quantify how much virus of COVID specifically is in that sample. And we're using the N gene, and I don't wanna get too, too technical, but the N gene is more a more conserved gene than the spike protein that, that has led to Omicron, and then that S protein is what interacts with our cells. The, the N gene is much more conserved, and this assay has been working really quite well across all of the different variants we've had over the last two years. So we quantify the, the virus using this machine, a quantitative PCR machine. That's Matt working diligently late at night to get the data. And then finally, Dr. Donaldson sends me the data that I try and uh, work with him to interpret and get to public health. So, so like I said, it's really important to understand what these data can and cannot say. So one of the big advantages is we're detecting both symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals because both can be infectious. Um, this includes people that aren't getting tested at different points in the pandemic. It was, you know, people didn't want to get tested or they lived too far away from a testing center or they couldn't get an appointment. And more recently, in the absence of direct testing, um, there's a lot more reliance on the wastewater to see what the trends are. Another important advantage has been the three to five day precursor to symptoms for those that are symptomatic. So you're shedding virus three to five days uh, before you're symptomatic into the sewer, and we can detect that. And if you you add the you know the slight delays in getting PCR results back, that means about almost a, up to a week of a precursor in the signal trends that we're going to see in the future. So that's really been helpful for public health. And right now we're actually trying to link that a little more carefully to um, hospitalization trends as well. So that's something that we're working on where you'd be about three to five days precursor to symptoms. If you're symptomatic, then there's probably three to five days before you go to the hospital. So we're working on an assumption that, you know, maybe 10 day precursor to what the trends would be for hospitals. That's a, a tenuous um, link, but that's something that we're working towards. So it also helps us evaluate public health measures on a community level if the signal's going up or down relative to certain, um, you know, restrictions on, on restaurants, that sort of thing. And like I said, we've been working very hard to give uh, public health next day data and, and not deal with some of the delays that, that have been happening with, with other PCR tests. So this isn't all about uh, wastewater trends in the community, but it's also really important for facilities and the residences, uh, the residents of those facilities, including some of the more uh, vulnerable populations where we were able to give a bit of a precursor to signals at a residence where they could say, okay, we're going to go in and test and we're going to try and stem the spread of this disease. 
or if there's a concern that that some people have been into the facility that were infected, uh, did they actually infect people in residence and confirming ongoing uh, non-detection? So, so both of those have been quite valuable, uh, especially to the retirement homes and to Trent as uh, we've got students returning to campus. So what do these data not say? Well, it's not invading your personal privacy in that I don't know uh, if it's Bob, Frank, Sue or Jim that have contributed to the, to the, the viral signal that we're detecting. Um, and while we've got some good idea about the specific trends in the community, we cannot link to an exact number of infections. Some people shed more or less. Some people shed for shorter or longer periods of time. And so all of these things really lead to some inherent variability. And I'm actually going to show you some raw data in a moment and, and why we actually try and look to um, seven day rolling averages for trends. But the data are also inherently challenging in that we have to control for the flow from you know rainfall events or snow melt event events snow melt events that might dilute our signal and even controlling for the num number of contributors or or even things like industrial discharge into the sewer that might influence our results so on to the data so what we've got here in blue are the raw data um we've got in kind of this orange uh, color, we've got our more normalized data relative to a, a pepper virus, and that's just a way to to control for the number of individuals actually defecating into the sewer. I won't get into that unless you guys have questions on that, but you'll see that these two trends mirror each other quite well. And we also see that, you know, it was really at the beginning, mid-December when we saw the increase in signal in this rolling average, it kind of plateaued mid-January and kind of in the last week we've been able to say yeah there's a definite decrease the signals are still extremely high and I want to contextualize uh, what we're observing right now uh, with the raw data and so we've got this insert here of the raw data and so we can see you know in November we had these little little increases and then it continued on to December and mid-December we started to detect the increase and up it went and and it's coming back down but it's still eclipsing things that we would have or signals we would have seen in the past. Um, for Millbrook, the signals may be hanging on a little bit longer than we, we'd like. I understand that there might be uh, some challenges. There have been some challenges at the school and at the uh, long-term care facility there. And then Lakefield, Lakefield is showing some really nice trends. But, but again, in these smaller demographics, the signals can go up or down quite, quite quickly. So, so I really appreciate your, you allowing me to, to speak to this work. and. Um, you know, we're also thinking to the future and how this program might continue and, and I'm hoping we can continue to expand to more vulnerable populations and give them more insight and and potentially even expand this work to other pathogens and those are things that that researchers are looking at right now so so again thank you very much for your time and I'll, I'll hand it back to uh, to Dr. Piggott. Thank you so much uh, Professor Kyle and uh, I thought that was really uh, useful and interesting for, for the media to hear, um, not only because it's very, very relevant to us as we're trying to better understand the current uh, COVID-19 situation, but I think it's a, a great example of how so many individuals in the community have come together and, and tried to help and support the pandemic response. Um, Professor Kyle is not a, um, a, a lifelong expert in uh, surveillance of infectious diseases uh, through wastewater. He has become one in the in the past year, um, but really um, this this is just an example of how people have come forward um, uh, with with no um, self interest, but an interest in helping to support our, our community. And you know, Professor Kyle, especially, I want to I want to thank you for all that work. Uh, I think it's um, uh, it's uh, behind the scenes, um, and often we don't uh, talk about uh, the way that it is helpful. But I think it's just really important to highlight and and share today, especially as we're um, trying to utilize it in a more active way to to follow the evolving situation. And I think it was really interesting. You're fantastic science communicator, um, and and hopefully, um, folks um, were able to uh, uh, to um, take away some of the key messages you shared. And I know that um, I, I think you'll be able to stay if there are any questions directed specifically towards you after I, I finish my remarks. Thank, thank you very much. It's definitely a team effort with a lot of contributors and I look forward to some questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you. OK, um, I'll uh, continue now and. Um,
I uh, I want to come back uh, to then the message that Professor Kyle left us with, which is that it certainly appears that there's um, some cautious optimism to glean from wastewater, that this virus is starting to plateau. What we might have expected, having looked at other countries, is for the number of cases to plummet off on the other side of the steep incline um, with wastewater. We are not seeing that. I want to be clear, we are not seeing that. We are seeing a decrease in a plateauing, but we're still seeing heavy transmission as compared to previous uh, periods. Um, the, uh, uh, the important piece to recognize is that continued vigilance is really important. Uh, we continue to be in a precarious situation in time in the pandemic. Um, the decreases in wastewater are um, evidence that the measures that we have put in place through the um, public health restrictions uh, from earlier in January and through the um, uh, and through the uh, delays in school opening and, and the good work everyone has done to try to limit their contacts and follow public health guidance. Uh, that This is all evidence that that is working, but it is not evidence that we are through this yet. And there may be further increases uh, to transmission as uh, the relaxation of measures do come. And so I'm very reassured by the province's cautious approach uh, to easing public health measures and, and the emphasis on following the data and the impact in particular particular on our healthcare system, which remains very precarious. We are not out of the woods yet, but uh, my main takeaway is that what we're doing is working and we need to continue to do that. And especially in this community where we have a higher number of vulnerable individuals, we need to continue to all contribute and do our best so that we can save lives and that we can continue to protect the really critical um, you know, pieces of our community and infrastructure, including schools and, and in-person learning. I'm going to speak briefly about absenteeism uh, and schools and uh, the continued um, response that we have to continue to uh, track and support uh, children, teachers, staff in schools to ensure that uh, the safest environment possible is is there. Uh, we continue to work very closely with our district school boards and I appreciate that. Um, one of the elements of this that we have done is that um, we have been looking at more than just the absenteeism data. We have uh, shared a letter to parents um, and requested that individuals voluntarily submit rapid antigen testing when it is used uh, appropriately um, to our survey. And you can see the link and uh, QR code on our survey here. Um, we follow that data that is submitted and we use it in combination with PCR tests which are less common with the changed criteria, as well as absenteeism data to do what's called triangulating, looking at schools from multiple angles and trying to ascertain, is there transmission happening in schools? And we will continue to protect in the best way that we can, including recommending enhanced measures, including recommending um, the dismissal of children who uh, may not yet be fully vaccinated to protect uh, kids and protect students in our schools. Uh, we know that um, uh, it um, is an additional ask um, and it is very much voluntary. I do want to make that clear, but we are grateful if, if parents can report these uh, rapid antigen tests, both negative and especially positive. Um, uh, there is an opportunity to include your child's school name and grade, and we are using that uh, data very quickly to make these decisions as to whether um, students who are not yet fully vaccinated uh, should stay home for a period of five days if there does appear to be uh, additional transmission of COVID-19. Uh, I want to also mention that we are also actively working with our child care sector in order to support them as well. So please stay tuned for more information on this in the coming days. And before I finish, I just want to take a moment um, to personally, uh, on behalf of myself, my family and our whole Peterborough Public Health Organization, thank the community for the outpouring of uh, support, kind messages and love that you've shared in this past uh, difficult week. It has been incredibly heartwarming. Um, you know, a particular thanks uh, to Janine, Amy and the, the Kawartha Now team and the, and the Facebook group that was created that is incredibly kind and and very much appreciated. And a, a few things I wanted to, to go through and mention in particular around that. Um, uh, Eddie, thank you for the drawing. It was very, very beautiful. Uh, yes, I am the new doctor who does like giving vaccines. Thank you. 
Um, I want to say thank you uh, to Ross and some of the other uh, children who drew pictures or Photoshop pictures, including of me as a, a superhero, which is very kind and humbling. But I assure you, there is no superhero costume underneath this. I just went to school for a long time to become a public health doctor and am doing my job here in the community. Um, but we do have lots of superheroes, not only on our Peterborough public health team, people all around the community that are doing their part and helping, frontline workers, healthcare workers, and each and every one of you who are doing your role and helping to stop this pandemic. I have, um, I have a book that I read one of my young daughters at night called um, uh, called Co Our Heroes of COVID-19. And, uh, and she loves this book. And it's a, a really lovely picture book that talks about all of the heroes because it isn't just the healthcare providers. It isn't just public health. It's um, frontline workers, people in grocery stores, people in our pharmacies, people doing our essential services and utilities. Um, it's been a whole range of people who have been our heroes in this pandemic. So she loves that book. And, um, and, and you should all know that you're all doing your part and, and being heroes as well. Uh, thank you, Emma. Uh, for your kind picture um, and, and the affirmation that I've got this. I hope so, and we're doing the best that we can. Uh, thanks, Matt, for your kind pics. Thanks to the Stakely Watson family for those kind pictures. And uh, so many more that I, I can't go through and, and name them all, but I do just want to say thank you for everything that you're um, uh, you're doing, uh, not only uh, the kindness that you've shared with me, but the kindness with each other. This is an incredibly difficult time. Uh, in an incredibly difficult two years now of this pandemic. So please continue to share love and support with each other and continue to do your best in, in our uh, work against this pandemic because it really is a team effort. So thank you and I'll turn it back to you, Brittany. Thank you so much, Dr. Piggott. Okay, uh, let's uh, have a chance to hear from our elected officials. Um, I believe MPP Dave Smith is uh, on the phone with us today. Uh, so if you've got some comments to share, um, MPP Smith, go right ahead. Oh, maybe he's... Thanks, Brittany, I appreciate that. Um, I am on the road right now. Someone else is driving though, if you're hearing the vehicle. Uh, I really don't have a great deal to today. I want to say thank you, though, to Dr. Piggott and uh, Dr. Mixon for what I think was a very successful telephone town hall on Tuesday night. We had uh, about 2,800 people in total who tuned in on, uh, on the phone, as well as a couple of hundred through social media. And I think that there was some very good information that came out by Dr. Mixon and Dr. Dr. Piggott. So thank you very much for taking the time to do that for us. I know it was well received by a lot of people. Dr. Pickett did mention that uh, Ontario is starting stage one of reopening again on January the 31st. And I want to reiterate some of his comments that although there are restrictions that are being lifted, although we are able to do some things that we have been able to do for the last three weeks, it doesn't mean that we're out of the woods yet. And I'm asking people to please still stay diligent wearing your masks and following the public health guidelines because we will get through this together if we work together. And the more that we work together, the sooner we'll get through this. Stay positive, test negative, because we'll get through it. Thank you. Thank you so much, MPP Smith, for, for making the time while you're on the road. I know it's so busy for you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Mayor Tarion and Warden Jones uh, had to uh, duck off the call, but they do um, uh, wanted they wanted to let everybody know that uh, they they appreciate being a part of this. And um, and uh, just a quick highlight that Mayor Tarion will be doing an Instagram live event with Dr. Piggott this evening at 7 uh, p.m. Um, and we also have uh, a representative from MP Michelle Ferrari's office here with us. Uh, Cindy Paul Girdwood is kindly joining us today. So welcome, Cindy. And I'm sure she'd be happy to take any media questions back if needed. So with that, uh, let us move on to our media guests. And we'll start with uh, Bill Hodgins. If you've got some questions for to start with Dr. Pickett, go right ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm just curious. With the with the walk in clinics and, and uh, a bit of an uptake on, you said two percent uh, in, increase. 
how can you give us a sense of how busy those clinics are right now? Like, we'll, 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 I don't think people really understand with Omicron. It, it, has it uh, died off? Is it still just crazy in there? Can you give us some sort of sense? It still continues to be very busy, and our whole team's doing um, tons of work. Uh, we have had a very busy month of vaccinating and uh, are doing way better than I even hoped that we uh, would have been able to do. We um, uh, we through the two weeks uh, around the holiday period went up from from what we were anticipating to a six fold increase in in vaccine appointments and through January have doubled what we were planning on offering which has involved bringing lots of staff in and extra help we're now starting to feel a uh, slowdown to that demand um, which means that we can uh, accordingly decrease some of the staffing and um, uh, and it is a little bit less busy than it had been. That slowing of demand, though, is is also somewhat uh, disappointing because it means that um, there are still loads of people who we need to vaccinate, um, but uh, people, uh, you know, who really wanted to come forward for the vaccine um, uh, have already done so, and um, and we are now trying to make it as accessible as possible through walk-ins to catch people who, you know, we haven't otherwise. Um, but with only 58% of adults 18 and older having had uh, three doses, we know there's a lot more uh, potential individuals out there to get vaccinated. And um, it won't be quite as, as busy and steady as it has been in the earlier parts of January, but I'm anticipating we'll be able to continue offering lots of vaccination um, support um, through February. Uh, so that people can still come forward and walk in. You have to remember as well that there was also people who through the last uh, couple of months have began their vaccine journey, gotten their first dose or gotten their second dose, and it's never too late. We want to encourage people to come forward if they haven't already. But the work of vaccinating will continue in other ways. We are anticipating uh, third doses to be available for other populations, such as those who are under 18 years old, and we are eventually anticipating a vaccine to be approved for those under five. But at this point, we're still waiting and, and hoping that will come soon um, and preparing so that we have capacity to be able to address that demand as it does arrive. Excellent. I, I think you answered my first, second, and maybe third question there. So uh, thanks. I'm, I'm good now. Sorry to preempt you, Bill. I, it wasn't my <laughs> intention, but uh, okay. Glad I could help. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, I'll invite uh, Reg Watson if there's any follow-up questions from the examiner or Peter Burrell this week. Reg? A, a quick question then for Chief Gilbert or anyone else in law enforcement. Just wondered, is the police going to do anything regarding the scheduled gathering early Saturday morning at Crestwood Secondary School? Has the school board approached police to get involved with that situation? And just any general comments on whether you expect any you know, traffic disruptions or anything like that related to the truckers convoy um, this week? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Reg. I think jo Inspector John Lyons is with us today. So, uh, John, are you able to to take that question? Yeah, most certainly I can, Brittany, and and thank you for the question. Um, so, essentially, uh, we are aware of some information out there that there is um, uh, not not information that there's going to be any um, any vehicles from the convoy necessarily, but definitely, um, you know, we're aware of a situation where. Uh, people may be gathering to go to a location um, where those vehicles may be. Um, but we definitely are working with uh, the school board. Uh, we're, we're always monitoring any of this information that comes to our attention and we work with them accordingly. Um, if there's a presence required, we'll certainly be there. Um, and we're always prepared uh, for whatever that may be. So. I hope that answers your question, Rich. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Welcome. Great. Thank you very much, Inspector Lyons. OK, um, let's turn it over to Paul Rellinger from Cowartha now. If you've got some questions, please go right ahead. Uh, I do, Brittany. Thank you. Uh, for Dr. Piggott, um, you know, we've been in and out of waves throughout this pandemic. And how do you balance um, you know, 
it's a good thing that we're we're easing restrictions, obviously. But how do you balance the fact that after each time we've done that, there's a real temptation for people to get lazy, not do what they're supposed to do, and then we're right back to where we need to be, you know, where where we've been. So what's your message to to people as we come out of this uh, situation right now? And on January 31st, there's going to be an easing of restrictions. Thanks, Paul. And I think my answer to that would be, um, we talk about restrictions, but um, restrictions are all very different depending on what we're talking about. And it's important to break things down. And the way I'd, I'd often communicate and divide them are restrictions that don't really impact us negatively and, and, and that we can continue to do easily and restrictions that do have social, economic, societal consequences, right? Impacts on businesses, impacts on community activities, social isolation, these are all impacts that have had a negative impact through the pandemic. We've done them because we've had to. We've had to do it to save lives. Um, and, and it makes sense that as uh, the situation allows, especially, uh, you know, as the health system um, um, is not exceeded and, and the capacity is not um, is is uh, ready to, to potentially handle more cases if they do arise. It makes sense to ease restrictions that have negative impacts, like like I mentioned. But it doesn't make sense to ease off on things that you and I, each of us, can do in our day to day lives, such as continuous strong use of a tightly fitted mask, such as making sure that we are ventilating our spaces. And, uh, and even if that's natural ventilation in your own home, if you're having somebody over within the um, guidance limits, cracking that window, cracking that door even once an hour, um, such as staying home if you are sick, and, and that is critical. We know that some people can transmit even without symptoms, but the most worrisome are people who may be going um, uh, uh, out and about uh, if they are sick because they could uh, potentially infect others. And so there are things that uh, we can continue to do and that I would implore the public continue to do really well uh, at a personal level that can help to um, uh, prevent the spread. Um, and, and again, a lot of this is about risk and some people will have different risk tolerances. Some people will have loved ones or themselves be elderly or at risk of more severe disease. And those individuals will need to be more cautious for the upcoming period. Some people like me have uh, young kids who haven't had their chance to be vaccinated yet and are more concerned and they should be more cautious as well. Um, but I think it has always been through this pandemic a balance between um, the measures that can have negative impacts and, and trying to ease those as um, it's possible while continuing the measures that we know have very little impact but are still helpful to prevent the continued pandemic. Uh, thank you for that. And just one more thing, Dr. Piggott, if I may. Um, Tuesday, we marked a, a bit of a milestone of sorts. It was two years since the first case was of COVID in Canada was detected at Sunnybrook Hospital. Um, I just want to get your reflections, if you, and you may not remember exactly where you were when that kind of happened, but uh, your thoughts at that time, um, did they, nobody could have kind of foreseen what we've gone through, but uh, what, what was your thought process at the time? COVID was in Canada, and here we are two years later. I've learned a lot in the intervening time and years, for sure. Um, but uh, by the time we had our first case in Canada, I'd been tracking this for three and a half weeks. Um, you know, as, as a medical officer of health, uh, we are on listservs and get communication, sometimes even before it hits the media. And so when the first cases of a new pneumonia were identified in, in Wuhan, China, I remember exactly where I was when I was reading those emails and that messaging. And I was very disturbed by the early events that, uh, that we saw there. Um, in public health, one of the challenges is always um, you know, reacting early, um, but, uh, you know, balancing that with the public's concern that we're overreacting and doing too much. It's something that we call the prevention paradox. You're darned if you do, and even more darned if you don't. Um, and, and so I very much remember those early days, my own concern, our efforts to really mobilize and make sure um, where I was working at the time in, in Labrador that we were ready for the pandemic. Uh, there was um, important work uh, to make sure that we had the infrastructure to uh, prevent the transmission, to test and diagnose 
um, as it as it happened. And I remember the first cases we had in Labrador um, because they were seven days after my first daughter was born. And um, and we had just gotten out of the hospital and gotten home. And I was planning on taking a few weeks off um, to, to be with my family. And that went through the window. And I worked every day for six plus months, um, you know, 12 to 20 hours a day, depending. Um, it, it was... Um, it was a different and, and difficult period, um, but in those two years, we've come so far. We have so much more in our toolbox. We know so much more about this virus, and uh, as a as a society, we're so much more ready to deal with whatever we face next. Um, terrific. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Piggott. And if I may, just one quick question for John Lyons, if I could. All right, go ahead, Paul. Uh, yeah, thank, thank, thank you so much. Um, I, I heard your answer um, to Bill. I had a similar question as, as Bill's, but I, I just wanted to clarify. Um, the school board has put out a statement saying that anybody who comes on that property without authorization is trespassing. And I just want to, I just want to get from a law enforcement point of view: is that indeed the case? And could anybody who's on that property be they an individual or perhaps a truck or two? be charged with trespassing if they're on that property? That's a good question, Paul, and thanks for the question. Essentially, what it, <clears throat> what it comes down to is <clears throat> whoever the owner, the caretaker, manager of the property is, um, if they have the authority to, uh, to make that decision, um, they can then make that request of us to act as an agent on their behalf. Um, so they'd have to give us that permission to uh, to provide that information to whomever may be on that property. Um, that would be the primary uh, and, and essential thing to start with. Uh, if that permission has been given and we've been advised that, uh, that people or persons that are on that property are not uh, permitted, then we would certainly have the ability to uh, act under the Trespass to Property Act. Um, so in that particular case, uh, you know, if, if it happened that somebody showed up and they were on that property and we've been given that instruction, uh, then we would certainly go and, and start that process. OK, um, so that that go ahead hasn't been given yet by the school board. We're always well, we're right now in, in working uh, again with them and, and sort of formulating this information, making sure that we're doing everything appropriately and that we are not, uh, you know, going unprepared. So. I can tell you that those uh, particular pieces are being worked on and and we, we will definitely be working close with them uh, moving forward. OK, and just sorry, one more thing. Would it be fair to say that knowing what we do know about plans to perhaps do something at Crestwood on early Saturday morning, will um, will the you know uh, Peterborough Police Service have a presence there or planning to have a presence there as a deterrent at least or? Well, without getting into too much around the uh, operational, you know, operations of, of the service, um, again, we're, we'll, we'll be prepared to uh, to deal with those issues as they come up. Um, and again, we've had those internal discussions. So um, if, if there is a presence there, we will certainly be uh, in a position to deal with it. Uh, again, working in relation with the school board. Uh, great. Uh, thanks so much. I appreciate it very much. And thank you, Brittany. Great. OK, thank you so much, uh, Paul and Inspector Lyons. Thank you. Okay. Well. Thanks. Um, let's uh, hear from Global News Peterborough. Jessica Nisnik, I think you're on the line with us. So go ahead if you've got some questions for Dr. Piggott. Thank you, Brittany. I, I do have some questions for Dr. Piggott. Um, Dr. Piggott, the, the latest death, when was that exactly? And uh, do you have any information on their age or whether they were vaccinated or not? Um, so our tracker will actually um, report two new deaths today, um, uh, and and that's come in as we've been on this uh, conference. Um, the first uh, is in an individual who is um, in their 70s. The second is an individual who is in their 50s. Um, 
Uh, so uh, both are, are individuals who have been uh, vaccinated and have received uh, three doses of the vaccine. Um, but a reminder that um, while we have seen some cases in individuals with two or three doses of the vaccine, with 90% of people vaccinated, that is the majority of the community. And the proportion of people that we've seen amongst our deaths amongst that 10% who have not yet been vaccinated is far higher. Um, it far exceeds the proportion in those who are vaccinated. Thank you. Um, just going back to something you said earlier that, you know, because people are wondering why are more people dying now? Um, you're saying, you know, more people are sick now than we've ever had before. But we also have the vaccines and, and Omicron is also supposed to be less severe. So, it, for lack of better terms, the math isn't really adding up there. What would you have to say? Well, the math is adding up because Omicron has been exponentially higher. It's been so much higher than any previous time in the pandemic. I don't have the exact proportion, but it's probably more than 10 times higher the number of cases at any given point. Um, and you would have seen as we were still doing PCR testing, and that was still on the mounting rise of the Omicron peak, uh, the amount of Omicron that has been out there has been so much dramatically higher than any other phase that uh, what we're seeing is that proportion of uh, people, even if Omicron's about half as severe um, as it has been, and even if um, uh, the vaccine has been protecting us, which is a big reason why we're seeing it be less severe, we still end up with individuals who uh, are amongst that small proportion of people who have more severe disease and who end up dying from this. Um, and so that is what we're seeing now. We are seeing um, individuals who largely um, now uh, are elderly, vulnerable um, uh, due to medical risk factors or conditions or unvaccinated who are amongst our deaths. Um, and that is why the vaccine is the most important tool in our toolbox, but is not the only tool in our toolbox. And the other measures to try to prevent the spread of Omicron continue to be really critically important. Thank you, Dr. Piggott. Um, I just, I don't know what you'd have to say. I, I don't know how to word this. I feel like if people who don't believe in the vaccine keep seeing people dying in the hospital with the vaccine, even though what you explained makes sense, it's discouraging them from going to get it, right? They think for some reason that they're right, that it's not going to help you. Well, here's one where we share some information with our law enforcement side, um, you know, uh, and and maybe, maybe um, John would have input, but we actually see more motor vehicle collisions and deaths among people who have not had a drink and drop of alcohol. And that's because the vast majority, nearly all of the people on the road, do not drink and drive. But when you do drink and drive, the risks are dramatically higher of having a motor vehicle coll collision and, and dying. And, and this is in public health what we call the base rate fallacy because 90% of our community now has uh, the vaccine and is vaccinated. Um, so even if a very smaller proportion of that population, uh, because of the protection of the vaccine, gets sick, gets severe disease and dies, um, the uh, numbers are actually bigger because it's 90% of the population, the vast majority who are now vaccinated. Um, and so when we look at the protections, those are pieces like the vaccine effectiveness. So back to my slide where I shared the Ontario science table, this vaccine continues to prevent um, more than 90, 95% of people who are vaccinated from going into the ICU and even more from dying. Um, and that's how we know those numbers um, uh, when we do those kinds of analyses. Um, the protections are significant of the vaccine and um, especially so uh, against severe disease and death for people who are at higher risk. COVID has always disproportionately affected people, uh, some people more than others. For people who are young and healthy, um, you know, there's always the chance, uh, the unlucky chance, but um, for the most part, people uh, will not die, even if they're unvaccinated and they get the um, infection. But especially for those more vulnerable and, um, you know, even for everyone, uh, the vaccine decreases 
uh, the risk uh, dramatically. And, and we've seen that. Um, this is again what we call the prevention paradox in public health. You wouldn't know what the toll of this Omicron wave would have been, but I would say it would have been nothing less than catastrophic had we not had the vaccine and taken other measures to prevent spread. Excellent analogy, Dr. Piggott. Thank you. I really feel that people sometimes need, you know, like you said, the drunk driving analogy to really understand it. So thank you. And um, I also just wanted to say I appreciated your your shout out for the thank you. And I'm really pleased that the community has offered all of this support for you. It's it's awkward. It makes me blush a lot. Um, definitely makes makes by uh, my parents awkwardly proud, um, but no, I mean, I, I really do appreciate it. Um, I, uh, I I think it's very kind um, and it's the true Peterborough that, that I knew and that I moved to. Uh, so I, I'm deeply grateful for all of that, but I do want to say, you know, please continue to share it around, um, share the love and, and spread love, not COVID uh, to your friends, families, neighbors. Uh, this is an incredibly difficult time as we continue this pandemic and uh, we just need uh, more love. Agreed. That's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks, Jess. OK, uh, let's hear from Matt Latour, who's joining us from Freak and Oldies Radio. Go ahead, Matt, with your questions for Dr. Piggott. Um, yeah, one of them had to do with uh, just ahead of the uh, partial reopening on Monday. I was wondering from your end, is there any concern about seeing, you know, cases increasing again now that people will be in restaurants and at movie theaters and things like that? Well, I would echo what our MPP uh, Smith had said. Um, as much as, as reopening is happening at an individual level, it continues to be really important. Be very careful about the decisions that you make and limiting contacts and limiting spread. Um, and uh, from a local level, what I will be continuing to do is my job of closely monitoring this situation and protecting our community, however uh, that uh, may need to happen. Perfect. And uh, I know Trent University and Fleming College uh, starting Monday to some extent will have some in-person classes again. I was wondering if those two uh, facilities or schools have been in touch with public health about how they can be doing that safely. We've had conversations. I've uh, written recommendations uh, to them um, and, and suggestions. So there has been uh, dialogue through this recent period as there has been throughout the entire pandemic. That's it for me. Thank you. OK, Thanks. great. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, all right, I think we have um, heard from all of our, our reporters on the line. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks again to our elected officials. And of course, thank you, Dr. Piggott, for always making yourself available for this. Uh, we will see you all back here in a week on Thursday, February 3rd and at 12 noon. So stay safe. And uh, if you need reference for this, it will be on our YouTube channel before the end of the day. Thanks again, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Bernice. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank Thanks. Bye.